Good evening. It's good to, to be with you all again for a Bible study here on Wednesday night at White House Church of Christ. Uh, we're going with the glasses this evening, but I uh, had a little bit of a, uh, a mistake with my contacts, but I won't belabor the evening with, uh, with that. I'll tell you another time if you'd like to know more. But I'm looking forward to this study. Um, this is one that, um, as we're talking about counterfeit Christianity, and how do we make that, uh, uh, that Christian life be genuine, be real, not a fake, uh, we've looked at several different things within our worship, within our Bible study, with the way that we talk to each other, uh, with our hearts. We're going to kind of pull all of those pieces together tonight, and I want us to look at what I'm calling, if you will, the, the four S's of uh, Christianity. And what, is, what exactly do you mean by the four S's? Well, when I think of an S, I don't know if this is what you think of, but I think of the power of Superman, the, the big S on his, on his chest. Uh, and, and when you see that, when you see that emblem, when that comes across, you go, oh, yes, I know that. That's someone who's got some power. It's got some force. We also have the power of that S, but I want us to see it in four different categories, four different uh, perspectives of, um, of our Christian walk. I want to look at the power tonight of silence. And I want to look at how our silence can be a way that we can uh, follow and, and extinct, uh, distinguish our role with Christ. I want to take you first to a song that you've sung, and, and I know that that's not on there, but the passage is Habakkuk chapter 2. And if you read the prophet, I love what he says here, and I want you to follow this real quick. He says, what prophet is the, what prophet, and not profit like as a person, but uh, cost, money, what benefit, what profit is the idol when its maker has carved it? You, you take a piece of wood and you carve an idol. What, what good is that? Or an image, a teacher of falsehood. For its maker trusts its own handiwork. Look how good I did that. Or look how shoddy that work is. Woe when he fashions speechless idols. They can't say anything. They can't think. They can't speak. Woe to him who says to a piece of wood, Awake to a mute stone, arise. It's, it's, it's idiocy. You know, that can't happen. And that is your teacher? That's what Habakkuk says. That's who you're going to take your instruction from? Something that, that you have created? Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all inside it. It's lifeless. But we don't worship that kind of a silent God. We worship a God that we are silent before. Look what he says in verse 20. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. And you've sung this song. The Lord is in his holy temple. And we understand that if God is dwelling within us, which he is, we are the ones who are silent. We must honor him. We must be respectful of him. We must be, we must be the kind of people who say, my God is to be feared. My God is to be revered. Remember we talked about that last week. My God is to be honored, respected. And that's where I find that I must be silent before him. So when I consider the, this idea of silence, I want us to look at Psalm chapter 62. And actually, as David writes this, both in the first verse as well as in the fifth verse, he says this. He says, my, his soul waits in silence for God only. I've got nothing to say before my God. I, I wait patiently in silence before my God and only before him. Then we go to Psalms chapter 46, and you've sung this one too. I know, you, I know that you have, at least I would be, I'd be surprised if you didn't. Be still and know. This is not me saying, you be still. This is God saying to me, and I am therefore quoting it. Be still and know that God is the one that I honor. And that he says, I am your God. Be quiet, be still, and listen. But what really caught me with this idea of silence and how as children of God, if we want to be, 
if we want to have the power and find the power of being silent before him, taking some quiet time, if you will, I want to take you to what Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 4. Now, we looked at that last week. We've looked at that several weeks. <clears throat> it's actually a fantastic uh, bit of scripture to find to be able to pull together that idea of the Christian walk and how we should live. And, and Paul lays it out so beautifully. And he talks about how in your Christian walk, you need to make sure that you, uh, uh, that you get rid of all the impurity and the, and the greediness he talks about in verse 19. And make sure that, the, that your former self is put away, that old life you don't, you don't follow. Don't be corrupted in the abundance with the lust of deceit. But be renewed in your mind. Change that. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to stop and think about what we're doing. Be silent. Meditate upon his word. What does God call us to do? How does he call us to live? And he said, put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. And then Paul begins here. As we look in Ephesians chapter 4. By the way, I should have said this at the outset. Let me say it right now. Hopefully you've got your Bible with you. But I really would like to encourage you to get a pencil and a piece of paper so that you can take some notes here. Because this is one that's very, very worthwhile coming back to, to review back again. Especially as you consider these four S's. Okay, the first one is silence. But notice what he says here in Ephesians chapter 4. And I'm going to go ahead and pick up in verse 25. Therefore, lying, laying aside falsehood. Stop being deceitful and false. Speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be, be sincere and, and stop being angry. Be angry and yet do not sin. You're going to have times when you're frustrated, but don't let that get carried away into sin. And do not let the sun go down in your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. If, you, if you're at that stage where you're going, boy, I really do not like the way this Trans, transpired. I really don't like the way that he treated me or she treated me. You cannot allow the sun to go down on your wrath. You can't. Because when you do, you've just given the devil an opportunity, a foothold, a chance to dig into your heart. You may be silent at that time, but it's a silence that will eat, will eat you up. But I want to take you then to the passage that you're already seeing on the screen. He says, let in no wholesome word, verse 29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only a word is good for edification. Build each other up. Don't, don't talk each other down. According to the need of the moment, do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And then he says this in verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. Now I'm reading out of the New American Standard. So your translation may differ a little bit there. But that's okay because you get an idea to see the difference. But I want you to look at those four, those five words. Bitterness. That, that gnawing anger. Get, get rid of that. That silent uh, grumbling inside your heart. That is deadly. Let bitterness go. And wrath, that's the, that's the mad, uh, uh, frustrated anger that you feel. And the anger that you have, get those things out. But then he says an interesting word, clamor and slander. Well, slander, I can get that. That's kind of bad-mouthing or talking down and uh, putting people down. And understand that slander. Put that away. But what exactly is clamor? As I was looking at this and studying with this, the thing that really made me, my eyes open up with that is clamor, in essence, is yelling at each other. He said, stop yelling. Stop yelling. H have you ever seen two people get into an argument and they figure, they, they think the best way to be heard is to yell? And to let that escalate? It becomes nothing more than developing wrath bitterness, slander. And he says, put that away, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. You see, if I want to be able to have the understanding of a Christian life and to be a, like the original, I have to be silent. I have to stop and think. I have to spend some time recognizing that God is in his holy temple. 
And I've got to make sure that my life is not filled with distractions, with clamor. Do we find ourselves yelling too much? Maybe not outwardly, but I'm afraid sometimes we yell inside. I'm afraid sometimes in our hearts there's a huge battle going on, and we need to be still. We need to be silent. Well, how do I do that? How do I get that peace? I think you need to call on Christ. He stilled the storm. And I think he can still the storm in our life as well. The first S that we need to look at is silence. The second S I want to direct you to is stewardship. And I'd like to take you and look, and, and, and look specifically at the word steward. What does it mean uh, to be steward? I see the value, the importance of being silent, but how do I, how do I become a good steward? Well, first of all, let's, let's understand that stewardship, that to be a steward of something, means you've got responsibility for it. You are the steward of this building. That means you oversee it. You are responsible for this building. You can break the definition down to basically these three words. To conduct, to manage, and to supervise. That's being a steward. Someone who, who manages uh, a respons- has, uh, manages something has responsibility for it. Someone who supervises has responsibility for it. Someone who's conducting the affairs of something has responsibility for it. So when you consider those three things, I want us to start first in the middle because I love the way this plays out in the Scripture. Matthew chapter 25, you read this many, many times. I'm confident of that. But Matthew 25 is one of the parables that Jesus spoke. As he's talking to the Pharisees and his disciples, as he's giving some direction to the people, but he uses the parable of what you, know, you and I know as the talents and the, the different levels of, of uh, uh, responsibility. Okay? The first one, it says the man was going on a long journey. Jesus says he's going on a long journey, and he's got the three uh, servants, the three, the three stewards. Uh, and one of them he gives five talents. One he gives two talents, and one he gives one talent. Something very important with this passage you need to understand, because it applies to us today. And I'm going to pick this up in verse, I don't need my glasses here. I'm going to pick this up in verse um, 15. This is Matthew chapter 25. You can pick it up in, chap- in verse 14 and flow all the way to the, uh, uh, to the 30th verse. But I want to pick up in verse 15. To one, he gave five talents. To another, two. And to another, one. But look what Jesus says here next. Each according to his own ability. It's what he could do. And the master of these slaves knew this guy can take care of five. I'm going to give him five. This guy can take care of two. I'm going to give him two. He can manage this much. And he can manage this much. And and this guy, I'm going to give him one. I don't know what his background. Maybe he wasn't a very good steward. Maybe he was a little slothful. Maybe he didn't take care of the responsibilities they need to take care of. But the master is saying in Jesus' story, I'm going to give you some, you ready for this? Some responsibility. I want you to show me what you can do. But each one according to his ability. You know the story. The first one, he took his talents and he multiplied them. He's got ten now. The second one did the same thing. He had two, now he's got four. Excellent. Fantastic. That's what I'm looking for. But what did that third slave do? What did that third individual do with his one talent? You know the scripture. The scripture says he buried it. He dug a hole in the ground and he buried it. And he gives an excuse. I knew you were a hard man. I wanted to make sure what you had was yours and I didn't want to lose it. You know, you get the excuses. But what I'm more interested in is the response of the master when he comes back. When the master comes back and he saw what he had, what he had, he said, "Why did I not put you in charge? Why did you not?" And he said, "Master, I knew you were a hard man. 
reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not sow seed. And I was afraid. I was afraid. You know, ladies and gentlemen, I think too many times we say the same thing. I was afraid. Why didn't you, why didn't you talk to them about, about Christ? Why didn't you show them the benefits of being in the kingdom? Well, I was afraid they might get mad at me. I was afraid they might laugh at me. I was afraid. That's legitimate. We say it. We know. We know what that guy's feeling. And he says, see, I still have it. I didn't lose it. Aren't you proud of me? I didn't lose it. It's still right here. But look at verse 26. It's not a good response. I'll just tell you right now. It's not a good response. This is what the master said. He says, you wicked, lazy slave. Whoa, that's pretty hard. That's pretty harsh. He called him wicked. He, he wasn't. He, he wasn't spending his money recklessly. He was, he was holding on to it and conserving it. But the master said, you're wicked and you're lazy. Why? Because you're afraid. Because you did not do what you were asked to do. And then he says to them, you ought to have put my money at least in the bank, drawn some interest, done something with it. I would have received my money back with interest, but instead you did nothing with it. He said, take the talent away and give it to the guy that's got five. Who's got ten, excuse me. The one who's got more and more will be given to him. But then, this is what I need to understand. If we're not supervising like we're supposed to, if we're, I'm sorry, if we're not managing like we're supposed to, if we're not being the steward that God calls us to be, if we wind up hiding the talent that God has given to us, if the parallel is accurate, this is what happens in Matthew chapter 5, verse 30. There is a punishment. And here's his punishment. This wicked, lazy servant. This is his punishment. Throw out the worthless slave. He called him worthless. Into the outer darkness in the place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know what he's doing is he's condemning him. Because he did nothing. I've told this story to, to folks at White House. And, and perhaps you've heard it as well. Uh, it was when I was still in grade, or middle school. And we lived on the farm in West Texas. And uh, we were working on the, the chicken pen. And uh, we had gotten the first layer down. We had the post in, already set them, and had the first layer down. It was a, it was a one before, and then a, uh, we ran a line of bob wire, then another one before. Space pretty tight so the chickens couldn't crawl through. And we got the first layer down. And it was late in the summer afternoon, and, and my brothers and I were helping our dad. And we kind of had enough of it, at least my Two of my older brothers and myself had enough of, enough of it. One of them was still working with Dad. But the other two had found some mud, some goo, and they were smearing it on one another. They are kind of rubbing it on one another, and just, just being boys, young boys. And I was hanging on the fence just laughing and carrying on because they they're just having fun. Well, Daddy had enough of that. And I remember he got himself up off the ground, and he walked over to one of my brothers, and he took him by the hand, and he pulled, my dad pulled his belt off, and he wore him out, gave him some swats. And I was like, whoa, this is pretty bad. But I didn't get off the fence, because I knew it was safe there. And then my dad went to get my other brother. Well, he started jumping back and forth across that first layer of the fence that we had set. And Daddy would go over here, and he'd hop back over, and Dad'd step over, and he did this back and forth for a little bit. And I was thinking, oh, you better knock it off, or you're really going to get it. And sure enough, Daddy eventually grabbed a hold of him, was really worked up, and wore him out. And then my dad came and pulled me down off the gate, pulled me down off the fence where I was standing watching. And he began to wear me out. And I'll never forget this, because I said to my dad, why am I getting swats? I didn't do anything. And my daddy said, that's why you're getting them. You see, I wasn't doing anything. I was just hanging out. I had buried any talent that I had, and I was doing nothing. And there was consequence. 
So you see, I know that's kind of a, a little antidote that's more personal, but it gets the point across for me to help me understand, if I've got a job to do, I better well do it. I don't have any reason to not do it. I must be responsible. The second one is supervision, and I'll take you to Titus chapter 1. If you want to turn there, you can. We looked at that last week. That's the admonition for elders, and he's talking about the, over, the overseers, and he says in Titus chapter Paul, Paul says in Titus chapter 1, verse 7, he said, the overseer must be a good steward. You have to be leading. You have to be supervising. You see, as an elder, part of the shepherding that the elder has is to watch over the flock, to take it by the hand and help them along. That's a responsibility. And an elder will take that up, and he will supervise the congregation. He's managing the congregation. He's doing and helping people see, but he's also giving direction. And finally, that idea of conducting. And I'll take us back over to Ephesians, back up a little bit more to Ephesians chapter 3, but you'll see even here in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 2, Paul says, for this reason, Paul, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of the Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you. You see, Paul said, I've got a responsibility. I've got a job. And my job, my responsibility, is to guide, is to conduct, is to be a steward for the Gentiles, to show them Christ. Are you conducting business the way you should be? When people look at you, do they see an avenue to Christ? You see, that's part of the stewardship. Ladies and gentlemen, that's your responsibility. You've got to manage the gifts that God's given to you. You need to be sure that you are on top of, uh, of uh, supervising and, and, and being that example and bringing people along. But you also have to make sure that you're conducting business properly. You have to make sure that you're guiding people and showing them Christ. I want to take you to serving because that would be our fourth, I mean our third our third S. We understand the value of silence and accepting our stewardship, our responsibility. It can really turn us then when we understand those two things towards service. And I, I can't help but think we, we ought to start first with Second Peter. Because when we see what Peter says here in Second Peter chapter, uh, chapter uh, 1, I'll go ahead and hop straight into this one. He picks it up, if you will, uh, around verse 5. He says, for this very reason, also applying all diligence... You see, it's not just kind of play around with this, but apply all diligence. That, that's, that's vigor. That's energy. That's zealous. Apply all diligence. In your faith, supply. And then he starts almost listing off some things that we should remember. We've got to remember. You've got to have moral excellence. Moral virtue. What does that look like? What's moral? What's immoral? You start to establish that and you'll know. How do you find the, the baseline for it? <laughs> oh yeah, God's Word. That's where I find out. How do I live a moral life? And that's where it leads to, as Peter wrote, knowledge. When you read, you'll start to understand that. And you've got to have self-control. You can't be flying off at the, at the handle. You've got to be able to have self-control to know this is what I must get done today. And self-control, perseverance. Oh, there's so many things I'd like to be able to do. But I've got to be, I've got to persevere. I've got to be under control and persevere with what I've got to get done today. It's, just, it's the idea of saying, of staying consistent, persevering in all godliness, in brotherly kindness with love. You see, brotherly kindness is the way we treat each other. And love is the example that Christ has given to us. If I want to be able to serve, if I want to have the power and the strength of the service, I really think we need to be looking at more than lip service. It's got to be, it's got to be something that will help us to grow. But in your service, I think it's important to note that we have to have gratitude. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews is going to give us a little bit better understanding and another glimpse of this idea of service. Hebrews chapter 12. 
I'm going to pick up in verse 28. This is the unshakable kingdom that the Hebrew writer uh, writes about here. He says, Therefore, since we have received a kingdom which cannot be shaken, that's our faith in our God, let us show gratitude. Gratitude is thankfulness by which we may offer to God an acceptable sacrifice acceptable service with reverence and awe. If I want to serve accept, with acceptance, ladies and gentlemen, I've got to have thankfulness. I've got to have gratitude in my life. I've got to have gratitude. It's not just saying it. It's living it. How can we encourage? How can we equip other people? Well, let's keep following the same process. Hebrew or Romans chapter uh, 12 Paul says, present your bodies as a living, uh, living and holy sacrifice. Ephesians chapter 4, roll back there again. It's the work of service. How can I equip each other? How can I lead people to serve if, I, if I'm not following the expectations that God has given to me through his word? When I understand the service, when I understand the protocol, and I abide within that, it's almost like the well-oiled machine. I have my purpose, I have my work, and I'm able to serve in the Lord's church. But you need to be aware of something. It's really easy, and maybe even more so now, because we are in, we're in, some, we're in some trying times. But it's really easy to say, you know, I think, um, I think I'll just uh, I'll, I'll take it slow. Because I've never been down this road before. I'm not sure how this is going to go. Actually, we do want to follow protocol. But don't, don't find yourself getting lazy. Remove pride. I've got this. Remove that laziness. It, it's like what I've said before on a Sunday morning. And, I, and I'm not just blowing smoke. I mean this when I say it. On Sunday morning, don't just roll out of bed and walk to the sofa with your cup of coffee and wait for the service to start on the computer. You've got to start getting your mind ready. You've got to be doing that all the time. If we are to have an acceptable heart of service, I've got to get rid of the laziness. I've got to get rid of the pride. And I can't just, <laughs> quite frankly, I can't just sit there. But I'm afraid sometimes that's the easy road. If I take that way, I can promise you, I am not serving. So get pride out of the way. Don't feel like you've got it all together. There's always room for growth, for learning, for developing. As Peter said, we have to be able to have that stepping, growing process of understanding ex moral excellence self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. Pride, laziness. Be careful that you don't fall in that trap because it'll destroy your influence and it will cripple your service to God. We talked about being still, being silent. We've talked about taking on the stewardship, the responsibility, and serving We've looked at the three of the four S's. The fourth one, without this last superpower, if you will, this last S, the Christian life will be a counterfeit. The Christian walk has to take all of these elements. And this last one is, as you've read, it's, it's steadfastness. It's persevering. It's keeping the walk going even when you don't feel like you want to keep walking. David wrote in Psalm chapter 51, it was right after he had been told by Nathan, you're the man, you're the one who committed this atrocity, you're the one who had this uh, woman as your wife and you shouldn't have done that, you killed her husband, you're the man, you're the one who should be punished. David begins the chapter, have mercy on me, O God. He recognized his sin. But in verse 10 of chapter 51, and we sing this one. Create in me a clean heart, O God. That's what the words of David were in Hebrews chapter 51. But then he says, create a steadfast spirit within me. 
You know what David is saying? Is He's saying, I don't want to move. I want to be here with God. Am I going to move? Yeah, I do. But it's not God moving. It's me moving. It's my selfishness. It's my laziness. It's my pride that gets in the way and keeps me from having the moral excellence, having the knowledge, having that perseverance and self-control in, in Christ. Paul writes, when he writes to the church in Corinth, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, towards the very end of the, of the chapter, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. You know, when you look at those words, steadfast, that means you're not quitting. You're not wavering. I'm going forward with this. Immovable. Think about that word, immovable. You know, if you were to come up behind me right now, I'm sitting in this, this, uh, this uh, office chair. It's got wheels on it. You could push me around. I'm pretty mobile right now. <laughs> not me. I mean, I am mobile. But that's not what we're looking for. We want to be steadfast and secure. I'm not going to walk away from this. I'm staying with my God. And I'm always abounding in the work of the Lord. That means actually overflowing. There's some individuals in my friendships in the Lord's church that are abounding in the work of the Lord. One of them, and some of you may know him, is Raul Ferris down in Kerrville, down at Riverside Church of Christ. An incredible servant of God. So steadfast, so immovable. Always overflowing in his work for the Lord. That's what Paul is calling for us to do. He then writes in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that we should stand firm. And the idea of not caving into the storms. And I think one of the, the best analogies to that is think about a storm that comes along the, that whether it's hurricane winds or what it might be, that the, the, the waves are enormous. They're, they're hundreds of feet up in the air. And, and I put the picture of the lighthouse just because I, I see that as being unmovable. If that's a weak lighthouse, it will crack, it will collapse. But if it's firm, if it's steadfast, it will not. That's what we want to be. We don't want to be quitting. Because quitting is the easy way out. Quitting is saying there is no hope. And if there's no hope, there is no God. I will not quit. I will stay steadfast. I will be unmovable. David writes in the 112th Psalm, I thought this was an interesting one. He writes in verse 7, his heart is steadfast. And as I was reading that, I thought, well, well whose heart is steadfast? David, is this your heart? But he gives me the answer in verse 1. Because he says, the first verse says, the identity of this man is this. It's the man who fears God and delights in him. That's the man. That's the man whose heart is steadfast. He goes on to write, the psalmist writes in verse 50, chapter 57, the heart, my heart is steadfast, I will sing praises. You know what that brings to my mind is James chapter 5. Is anyone cheerful? <laughs> he is to sing praises. Do you, have a, do you have joy in your life? If storms are coming, maybe you don't have joy in your life. But let me ask this. Is Christ in your life? If he is, then you should have joy in your life. Does it mean it's going to be easy? Absolutely not. Are there going to be times when the storms roll? Without a doubt. How do you handle that? Will you be steadfast? Will you be immovable? Will you crack? You know, there's a song that uh, helps me to see that, and I saw it really well as I've learned this song. But when I think about the storms of life, I don't know if you can read that, that last one there, but I'll, I'll, it's, it's actually the first verse of a song that we don't sing very much, although it was written the, in the late 50s. It's entitled, Until Then. And it would be a great song for a congregation to sing, because actually it's in one of, our, one of our newer hymnals. My heart can sing. My heart can sing. Oh, that's Psalms 57. 
when I pause to remember. Take a break and be silent and think. A heartache here, it's, it's but a stepping stone. The things I struggle here in life is just one more step. One more step where? Along a trail that's winding always upward. You see, this troubled world, it's not my final home. We're going to look at that a little bit more in detail next week. But the song concludes in the chorus with this. You see, I can sing, regardless of the adversities in life, if I'm steadfast. If I know where I'm going, if I know the end game and my objective, then my heart can sing. And I can pause to remember, a heartache here is but a stepping stone. Along a trail that's winding always upward, this troubled world is not my final home. But I'm not there yet, and you know that. And so, until then, to quote the psalmist, my heart will go on singing. And I love this next line. Until then, with joy... I'll carry on. Until the day my eyes behold the city, until the day God calls me home. Stay steadfast. Don't give up when storms come. Be serving and be looking for ways to serve. Have, have si a moment for silence and to, and to meditate and to think about the blessings that God has given to us and then realize you've got responsibilities. Be a good steward of the things that God's given to you. Be silent. Be a good steward who's responsible. Serve. And never, ever quit. Be steadfast. We're down to only three weeks in this month. Uh, correction too, because this class is over. So in the next two weeks, what we're going to do next week is we're going to do the last lesson of counterfeit Christianity. And it's going to be entitled, Are You a Genuine Note? Are you, are you a really a Christian? Are you really doing this? Or are you just kind of playing the game? You know, there's a game called the game of life. I don't know if you've ever played it before. But you, you, you get yourself a, the board, and several of you are playing. I might even bring it next week. But you get a car, a little, a little vehicle, and you get your own body, your own little person, little peg. And then you spin the wheel, and you determine what route and what road you'll go. Will you get married? Spin the wheel will tell you. Will you have kids? Spin the wheel will tell you. What kind of job will you have? Spin the wheel. That's a game. That's a game. This life is not a game. This life that we live is a life that God has given to us to live for Him. Are you genuinely going to do that? You have said you were. If you, if you have taken Christ on in baptism, you said, I'll do that. Now, if you haven't, you're, you're not even in the game yet. If you haven't accepted Christ on in baptism, then you're just still on, on, you're looking on the outside of the looking on the outside you need to take that plunge and I don't mean that lightly you need to make that decision to say God's called me to be his child to follow his word to be silent to be to be a steward that follows his responsi the responsibilities he's given to him to be a service to him and to his people and to never waver in that when you make that decision and many of you have, if not all of you are listening here. I don't know who's listening here. But if you've made that decision, are you going to be genuine to that? Or are you just kind of playing the game? Be a genuine note. Because I fear if you don't, you'll be found as a counterfeit. And the counterfeit, it's worthless. And the wicked lazy servant who did not fulfill his responsibilities, was cast 
he was cast out. I want to encourage you to look and examine your life. Be genuine. That'll be our last lesson next week. And then I've got a surprise for you on the last one uh, of, the, of the month. So thank you so much for tuning in. I hope that it's worth your while. I hope that you've taken a few notes. You know you're always welcome to give me a call. Anytime you have a question or you'd like to know a clarification on something, let me know. I didn't even have my laptop up here today. It was just, it was just God's Word and you. But I wanted to go ahead and, and uh, uh, spend that time with you. I hope it was a, a benefit to you. Moreover, I hope it was a glory to God. Let's bow and then we'll go to our Father in prayer and be dismissed. Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you for the opportunity to study, to have your word. And I pray that we will read it, that we will be silent, recognizing that you are our God. And Father, I pray that you will help us to be the kind of stewards who are responsible uh, and that we will take our responsibilities seriously and that we will not be lazy. And help us, Father, to serve and help us to look for ways that we can be of service in your kingdom. Regardless of whether we're, we serve in a leadership role or, or not, Father, we must serve. And I pray we'll do that with all of our hearts. And I pray that we will be steadfast, never wavering, never moving, but firm to the end with the example of Jesus Christ as our support. Bless us and keep us this night is my prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Let's rise up and finish.